Good morning, everyone, and thank you, Kevin, for the introduction. And it's uh, great to be back here in Singapore at the Marine Money event. Uh, I'm going to do the usual. There's going to be a lot to take in. I'm going to talk quite quickly. I will be around if anybody wants to ask questions afterwards. As I've not been here for three years, and MSI haven't presented here for three years, I thought I would just do a quick whip through and look at that, so something of a health check of the industry, looking back over the last three years, and also sort of looking where we are on, on the earnings profile. But to start off with, I thought I'd uh, have a quick look at what was going on the demand side. Uh, this is just a chart that shows year on year incremental changes in demand across commodity types, across vessel types. You can see that this starts, the chart starts off in 2019, it goes to 2022. Now, under the circumstances of global pandemic, global trade and shipping performed, I think, exceptionally well. 2020, we did see some negative growth rates, primarily in the crude sector, product, and the car carrier sectors. But if you look at the orange numbers below the bars, these are the aggregate growth rates over those four years. And you can see, apart from crude and chemical tankers, everything else has bounced back. And in some instances, it's bounced back with quite some vigor. For example, LNG and car carriers. If we look at the other side of the coin, and we have a quick look at the supply side, Usually, when I've stood up here over the last 12 years, I'm saying the demand side's looking quite bullish, but we've got to be looking at the, the, the supply side. The supply side is the worry. Now, I'm talking about the last four years. The supply side hasn't been a problem. It's been low single-digit growth for tankers, bulk containers, gas. It's still been single-digit growth, but a little bit higher. So that hasn't given us any concern over the last three or four years. So where are we on the earnings cycle? This is a slide that uh, I've resurrected, uh, a conference favorite, a marine money favorite. For those that haven't seen it before, what it's there to do, it's a schematic. Please don't make any investment decisions based on this slide. What it's there to do is to show effectively where we think each individual sector is on the earnings cycle and the relative positions for one sector versus another. Now you'll notice I've made a, a slight amendment to this slide versus ones I've been presenting for eons before today and as you'll see the dotted line and that's just to represent just how high container ship markets have been over the course of the last couple of years. You'll also notice that container ship markets, we think, are coming off. We've seen uh, earnings for this sector come off over the last, certainly over the last couple of weeks. Dry bulk has also fallen from grace over the course of the last couple of months. Row rows, MPPs, they've had some strong fundamentals, but they've also been riding on the coattails of containers. And we think that they're sort of at their peak and are about to teeter off uh, the top of the, their markets. Everything else is on the upside. Some are in the foothills, such as offshore, but everything else is sort of climbing up the peaks. Earnings are going to improve. The markets are going to get better. And just to give a, an idea of cash flow uh, with some of the earnings that we've seen, I've uh, presented here just break even, the simple operating costs and uh, debt service to, to the banks and then the one-year TC rate uh, emphasized by the red line. And what we can see for some sectors, there's quite a bit of headroom between break-even and one-year TC rate, enough to service any equity. And if you look at the containers or LNG, there's a lot of headroom there, and a, a lot of money has and continues to be made. And just to put those earnings into another set of perspectives, what I've done is look at earnings at the start of the month, and I've compared those against decade averages. The, uh, the decade at the start of the century, de the last decade, and what also we expect to see the average decade earning for the 2020s. So containers, LNG do stand out in terms of the minute the earnings are very, very strong, but across the board we're seeing strong earnings. And you'll also see from our forecast for the 2020s, on average, the 2020s will perform, if not the same as, better than the last two decades. So that's enough of the sort of health of the, the industry looking back. What I want to do now is sort of take a look forward 
and see how the markets we expect will develop uh, here on in. And the first topic I want to discuss is inefficiencies within the fleet. Now, I know these were mentioned yesterday, uh, and I think it's a good job that they were mentioned yesterday because these are some of the factors that are really have been driving the market over the last couple of years. And there's been a, a huge wave of inefficiencies that we've seen within the market. Uh, a lot of these have been sort of started due to some COVID-related events such as... Uh, uh, crew changes, route deviation, etc. But there have also been other events such as the Ever Given getting stuck in the Suez Canal. There has been something of a perfect storm when it comes to inefficiencies within the trading fleet. Uh, and I think one of the easier uh, metrics to measure when it comes to inefficiencies is port congestion. Uh, I've just put two simple charts up here. The one on the left shows uh, container ship port congestion. This is not just absolute port congestion. This is port congestion above and beyond what we saw in the average period 2016 to 2019. And you can see that in some months we've seen port congestion, a million TEU of container ships sat outside ports waiting to load or unload. That has introduced a lot of inefficiencies within the container ship sector and is probably just the tip of the iceberg what we've been seeing from the land side uh, supply chain infrastructure too. You'll also notice over the last couple of months some of this port congestion has started to unwind and this will of course be one of the many reasons why the container ship sector has come off the recent highs. On the right hand side we can see uh, a slight different chart but trying to get across the same message this is dry bulk port congestion, but we've weighted it by commodity grouping. If you look at the average, the dotted line, you can see that port congestion has been up around 25% versus the 2019 average on an index basis. But for iron ore, it's been up to around 35% uh, higher than that 2019 the pre-pandemic year. And to really sort of try and wrap our arms around what this port congestion, what inefficiencies have really meant to the industry over the last few years. Uh, I've put together a couple of charts here. There are fundamentally, we think there are potentially three ways in which you can measure trade. The first one is trade, which is just effectively cargo, how much cargo is moving from A to B, whether that be million tons, million cubic meters, boxes, et cetera, et cetera. You can then add on the ton mile, so the distance that cargo is moving from A to B. And then what we tend to analyze and we model and we forecast at MSI, the shipping demand. So we're looking at trade, we're looking at distances, but we're also looking at time, speed, we're looking at time at port, uh, waiting times, ballast ratios, et cetera, et cetera. So I just want to emphasize two points, one from the oil tanker market and one from the dry bulk market. If we look at the oil tanker market in 2020, we can see that trade growth was minus 7.5%. Ton mile was minus 7%. That means that oil that was moving was moving over a slightly longer distances than it had done the year before. If we look at shipping demand, how many ships we need to service that trade, although ton mile was down 7%, actual shipping demand was only down by about 0.5% because the fleet was so inefficient. Any vessel that was carrying cargo was waiting to offload. There may have been a, a storage element on that route. So things didn't look as bad as they could have done from an earnings perspective in the tanker market in 2020. If we move across to dry bulk and we look at our forecast for 2023, the light blue bars, we can see next year our forecast for aggregate trade in dry bulk is 2.5% positive ton mile we think is only going to be growth at around one one and a half percent but it's the shipping demand next year although we expect to see cargo growth increase due to the unwinding of the inefficiencies we actually think that shipping demand will be closer to minus two percent for dry bulk next year I want to take a, a, a slightly different turn now and now start talking a, a little bit about trade and bilateral trade flows and start off with China. The industry has looked towards China for some chunky growth numbers effectively over the last 20 years. I think 
We're not saying that China is going to stop growing, nowhere near, but we do think there's going to be something of a slowdown. I just put together four, I wouldn't say random charts, because I did think about it a little bit, but four charts to try and emphasize what I mean by the slowdown across a range of sectors. The top left-hand chart, we've got Chinese property market. We can see that that has fallen off quite significantly over the course of 2022 uh, for, the, for the period March to July. We can see the top right, steel output in China. That's fallen off a lot over the course of the last 10 years. Same with iron ore imports. On the bottom left, we've got Chinese refinery capacity. We can see that there's been a huge amount of growth, but again, we're going to see growth in the future, but it's going to be low single-digit numbers. And to, to appease some of the, the, on the manufacturing and the exports, we can see that Chinese exports as a share of GDP growth has dropped considerably, so it, it's certainly under 20% now. So there's lots of signals coming out of China that, that things are changing. And the one that I just wanted to put under the microscope a little bit more, because I think this is, this is the one, and uh, dry bulk trade relies so heavily on China for, uh, for incremental demand, it is dry bulk. The chart on the left just shows our aggregated position of dry bulk cargoes across the four main groupings, iron ore, coal, grains, and minor bulk. The red line shows year-on-year -year growth rates. And this is nothing new. It's not like I'm here trying to say that growth has been at 20% for the last five years and it's going to drop to zero. We can clearly see a trend line in that, that red line over the course of the last 20 or so years. And we do expect actually growth in an aggregate form to shrink in China for dry bulk over the course of the, next, the rest of the decade. And you'll see that is largely being driven by the uh, coal. The yellow bars are getting shorter as China tries to move away from coal and relies more and more on domestically produced coal. Now, this shouldn't necessarily come as a surprise. China's gone through a huge period of industrialization and it's not the first country that's gone through industrialization. We can look towards Japan to see what happened to Japan in the second half of the last century. And what we've done here is we've simply overlaid China's uh, steel consumption with Japan's steel consumption. Now, of course, we're talking about different levels, but the shape, I think you'll agree, looks very similar if we look from uh, the first four decades of China's industrialization and Japan's industrialization. And then you can see our forecast thereafter. So Japan started cooling, and we do expect to see China cooling uh, as we go out into the middle of this century. Now, China is just obviously one part of the global trade map, and we're starting to see a lot of other changes in terms of global trade. Uh, and some of those have been brought about more recently by the events in the Ukraine and the Russian invasion of Ukraine. We're expecting to see some quite significant changes, and we do expect to see that these changes will last. They're not going to revert to the way they were anytime soon, even if potentially some of the sanctions were withdrawn. We can see on the left-hand side, this is our Black Sea and Baltic crude and product exports by destination. We can see the yellow bars, which were the share of Russian oils going to Europe is going to uh, come, come off significantly next year when the sanctions kick in. And we can see something similar for uh, Russian LNG. Uh, no longer will it be going to Europe. Uh, the ultimate destination will, for a lot of that uh, LNG, be Asia. So some big changes there in the energy markets. It's not just Russia. Uh, if we look towards the US, and we look at the US's development of crude exports, over the last few years. We can see that A, volumes have picked up significantly, but B, a lot of this crude is moving over longer distances. It's moving to Asia. And what I've tried to do is sort of pull all of this together in a simple chart, which is the chart on the right, which just shows seaborne crude flows by route type. And I've categorized the route types into short, medium, long, or ultra-long route types, and the dotted line shows the share of crude that's increasingly going to go on long or ultra-long routes. And you can see that that is going up 
quite significantly over the course of the last 10 or so years, and we expect it to continue to do so. So by the middle of this decade, around 60% of oil, all oil crude on the water will be going on long or ultra-long distances. So that's really good news from a, a market development and uh, the earnings outlook for the crude markets. It's not just uh, crude. Uh, we're seeing US LPG exports again, a lot of this is, is going from shorter haul routes to longer haul routes, heading east. And interestingly enough, if we start looking on the dry side, uh, bauxite uh, is a growing commodity. Uh, and the, a lot of the bauxite that was coming from Indonesia and heading towards China with the Indonesian bans that are being put in place every now and again, this has really given the chance to Guinea to come to the fore. And 50% of all Chinese bauxite is now serviced by Guinea. Again, a lot longer ton mile distances, so good for, for shipping fundamentals. Now, if we sort of, that, that's very short term. What I want to do now is talk more on the medium to longer term. And uh, at MSI, we now have an energy model. We're now forecasting out to 2050. Our energy model sits over the top of all of our shipping models. And if we're forecasting out to 2050, we have to have an idea of what's going to go on with the energy landscape. And then ultimately, what that ultimately means for shipping, what ships we need, where will they be trading, the bilateral trade routes, and what that means for earnings and values of the ships, ultimately. These are just two headline charts that I've taken out of the model. The first one is transport demand. Uh, and you can see that we, we think, and it's not just us, people like the IEA are also thinking similarly, Oil demand for transport will go down, certainly from 2030 and onwards. On the right-hand side, we can see energy, uh, electricity generation by fuel type, and you can see the big blue wedge that's coming, which is renewables. Obviously, that, again, will have an impact to the shipping markets. I wanted to just focus in on one, just to sort of follow it all the way through to what actually it means for shipping, and in this instance, I've picked dry bulk and, and coal more specifically. The charts on the left show uh, coal imports by destination, and here I've just looked at China, Europe, and South Asia. We can see that Europe imports of coal have uh, effectively already peaked. China, we expect to peak in the next two or three years. The real growth story for coal has to come from uh, South Asia, and more, more importantly, India. What that actually means for shipping is on the right-hand side. So this is basically you can see total volumes. That's the, the red line with on the chart. But then you can see our breakdown of where we think it's going to impact different sectors of the dry bulk market. So we expect to see the, the middle sizes, the Panamax, the Kamsar Max is squeezed. Uh, and that market share will be taken more by, interesting enough, the handy, the handy max, the ultra maxes, because a lot of coal is going to be moving into developing countries that don't have that landside infrastructure that perhaps uh, the, the Panamaxes and Camson maxes have been usually servicing. So that, that's all I was going to say on the demand side. I'm now going to flip things and just talk a little bit about supply side developments. Uh, and uh, I think, you know, if we're talking about supply, we can't not talk about, or at least start off talking about contracting. Uh, we've seen a real bifurcation in contracting volumes over the, law, uh, over the last couple of years. A real focus on container ships and gas at the detriment of dry bulk and even more, even more so tankers. Very, very few tankers have been ordered uh, recently. You can see next year we expect to see contract volumes relatively low, uh, driven by new build price and also the yard capacity, which I'll come on to uh, a little bit later. What this really means is the order book looks very, very different depending on uh, whether you've got container ship goggles on or whether you're looking at, uh, at uh, tankers and bulkers. If you're looking at tankers and bulkers, the order book as a percentage of the fleet is in very low single-digit numbers, some of the lowest order books we've ever seen. Which, which frankly is fantastic for a supply demand fundamentals as, as we move forward. The container ship, that number has crept up to near a 30%. So the container ship order book now is at around 30% of the, the trading fleet. It's back to that long-term average. Uh, that, that is a sort of a worrying tale given that charter rates are already falling off before any of this tonnage has hit the water. 
But with the supply size, there's always a safety release valve in the form of scrapping. And the fleet has been getting older. This is just an age profile across, uh, across most of shipping, just to show certainly on a numbers basis, there's a lot of old vessels out there. And even in, uh, if we look at things in capacity, there's an increasing number of older vessels. One of the things that will help with the scrapping is the regulations that are coming around the corner. And uh, we've been doing a lot of analysis at MSI in and around the regulations. Uh, I think it's important to say that not all old ships are bad ships. And you really do need to look at the individual assets to get a sense of how they perform with EEXI, CII, etc. going forward. Uh, we've added into our FMV platform our assessment on individual vessels, where they uh, sit in alignment with the Poseidon principles getting to zero uh, 2050 CII and EXI for individual vessels, and you can also do that at an aggregate portfolio or fleet level. So that's a new addition to our platform over the course of uh, 2022. But I think it, it's important to say that, that although, as I say, all individual vessels aren't similar, if you look at individual fleets, how these regulations are going to impact different fleets will also be different. And I've just taken this example for CII. This is how, if we look at how vessels were traded in 2021 and replicate that out to the CII for 2023 to 2026, we can see there's a very big difference between what goes on in tankers versus what goes on with dry bulk. So just to give you a flavor of some of our scrapping forecasts, we can see that we are expecting some quite strong scrapping volumes for tankers, bulks, containers over the course of the next uh, year or so. Finally, I just wanted to say uh, a little bit about shipyards and values. Uh, anyone that's gone to try and order a ship recently, I'm sure that that first chart will, will ring home. If you want to order a ship today, you're probably looking at a delivery slot in 2025 now. So we're sort of going back to what we were seeing in uh, the super boom years, that three and even four years out until you get your asset. The yards are, is being complicated a little bit more at the yards because vessels are getting bigger. And you can see the chart on the right just shows the uh, average size of vessels ordered. Certainly for container ships, for tankers, the average size of vessels being ordered are getting larger. That's given the yards a bit of a headache in terms of tessellating what they can fit in at what berths alongside what other ships. What we have seen is uh, we've always believed, and uh, when I've talked about shipyards before uh, here in Singapore, is that shipyard capacity is elastic. It's not, it's not static, and we can see that shipyard capacity has increased given the, the influx of new orders, which has been good in terms of trying to squeeze vessels in. But it's bad in the short term from a new building price perspective. If we look at the chart on the right, this is just trying to capture what, why we think that it's potentially bad uh, and which way we expect new building prices to go. The yards are very much operating on the cost of building the assets, but then also yard forward cover, the relationship between the global order book and capacity. Once deliveries outstrip contracting, then there's downward pressure on that yard forward cover. And you can see on the chart, 2023-2024, uh, we expect deliveries to outpace contracting. This will help pull down new building prices, we think, next year. But second-hand prices have been going gangbusters for a lot of sectors. We can see here, just for tankers, bowls, containers, the yellow line shows 2022 uh, values for five-year-olds above the five-year averages, above historical averages. We can all see, also see that Panama, uh, for bulkers and container ships, we've finally seen a turn in those second-hand prices. And we expect with earnings, and this chart is just to show you our view of current earnings versus uh, our forecast for earnings in 2024 against uh, historical ranges and a box and whisker plot. We can see for, for many sectors, we're expecting to see uh, earnings come off the astronomical highs that we've seen them recently for, for containers and dry bulk. Others for VLCCs, for car carriers, we still expect to see some uh, positivity within the markets. But 
what I've tried to do in my last slide, and I appreciate I'm rushing a little bit now just because of time, but in my last slide, I've finished up with what I always do is uh, an investment opportunity. So if you had to go and uh, buy a five-year-old or a 10-year-old, and you had to sell it in five years' time, what sort of returns could you expect? Even though we're expecting to see new building prices for, many, for, for all sectors go down and earnings go down over the, over the duration of the next five years. And uh, I've run that through all, all uh, MSI's FMV uh, and Horizon product. And you can see, uh, primarily, you would be better off buying a 10-year-old versus a five-year-old asset currently. Apart from car carriers, which we still expect to see some, some distance to run, a lot of the other sectors where we're, we're expecting to see sort of positive IRR returns are in the wet sectors, and perhaps it's unsurprising that we expect to see the container ships, which are still f very fully priced, uh, some of the, the lowest returns on investment over the course of the next five years. So uh, that's where I'm going to end. Uh, I will be around if anyone has any questions. Thank you. Thank you.